So we have an opportunity for the people who haven't spoken already to give a, a, a brief few words. And I, I thought I might give uh, them an extra little assignment. Um, so if you could say a few words of, of your choosing, but also uh, I've got a list of, of easy to define words here. Um, Max asked for free will, that's in the mix. We've also got observer, we've got agent, we've got life, and we've got consciousness. So, so, so the cruel task which with, with which I am uh, uh, assigning you is, uh, please also give a definition for one of those terms, uh, any definition you like for one of those terms. You can choose, you can choose one of the easy ones. Um, Say them again. <laughs> observer, yeah. agent, free will, life, or consciousness. Who wants to go first? No. Does it have to be serious? No. <laughs> yeah, I'll go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> My definition of consciousness is that which is able to complain. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. And did you want to say anything about anything else? Do you want to talk any? Uh, you're going to be speaking tomorrow, but but feel free to say a little bit about anything. Tell us a surprising fact about your. Life. Yeah, I want to I want to say something about the Lartz paper. <laughs> I think it's a you know like a, there was a reference to it today in Jim's talk, mm -hmm. and um, where's Jim? And I actually I think it's a really great paper, and I think um, it's one of these papers where. I'm so glad and so happy that I, you know, German is my first native language. I mean, usually I'm not that happy that I grew up in Germany because it has all these drawbacks. It's like cold and rainy and miserable. But um, just to read like papers like that, it's really great. So I urge you to learn a little bit of German and read the Lord's paper in the original because the English translation is actually terrible. And uh, he has basically figured the whole thing out in that paper and I think maybe in a way that has been not entirely pointed out by all the many other authors that have written about the Zillard engine ever since. And so, I don't know, I just think it's a great paper. Do you know who his first author was? Co-author? Co collaborator? On the paper, it's just his name. Right. So, do I know no, anything who, about Zillard's uh, personal life in 1929? No, I don't. Do you? Einstein. The first to read her and comment her on the paper. And how do you know that? Uh, Szilard's biography. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, it's a nice biography, actually. Cool. And what did Einstein have to say about it? It's quite encouraging, actually. He said, "You'll go far, young man." <laughs> <laughs> well, Szilard was an interesting kind of itinerant character. So he was. Yes. <laughs> well, he was one who persuaded Einstein to write to Roosevelt about the man. Yeah, that's right. Oh, exactly. What yeah. became the man? Yeah. 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 Uh, I, uh, Szilard persuaded Einstein to write to Roosevelt yes. about the dangers of an atomic bomb. Szilard was the first person to realize, well, one of the very first people to realize that you could use nuclear fission to make an atomic weapon, and then he realized this could be bad. He was a pacifist, and he he uh, got uh, Einstein to um, to write to Roosevelt. He I actually it. remember Murray Gelman telling me this story about how Szilard was, was running this conference on pacifism, and both Gilman and Wigner wanted to go, but each could only go to half of it. And they asked if it was okay if Murray went to the first half and, and Wigner went to the second half. Szilard thought for a while, and he said, your brains are not entangled. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, he okay. holds the British patent for fission. I'm sorry? He holds the British patent for the fission bomb. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Paul. Oh, right. Uh, definition. Um, and, and anything uh, else you'd like to add you know, uh, about what you're thinking about and, and how it relates to this session? Uh, okay. Uh, well, first, uh, to get this out the way, um, I think uh, I would have, uh, I like uh, to think of life not in terms of the stuff of which it's made, which is what a lot of people working on prebiotic synthesis uh, do. How do you do the chemistry? I have nothing against chemists, but I think that they've got a long way to go. Uh, I see the real secret of life is uh, the way it processes information. If you talk to a biologist, they use the language of uh, 
um, signals and uh, codes and transcription and translation. It's, it's all about information storage and management and processing. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess it was Jim who was saying that, um, maybe it was Joshua, maybe you both said about the analogy between uh, living systems and electronic circuits with logic components and wiring diagrams and uh, uh, in many cases, you can treat these things as a Boolean network. And so if you take the gene regulatory network, for example, for the cell cycle of yeast, it's something we've been doing. Treat it as a Boolean network. You can look at information patterns. You look at things like transfer entropy. Uh, and uh, uh, you can work all that out. You can do these computations. And there are distinctive motifs. So life uh, is managing information in a distinctive way. It's a very visionary paper. You'll have to stop me. I'm going to get into full flight. <laughs> by Paul Ness, the uh, former uh, president of the Royal Society, called Life, Logic, and Information, uh, published in Nature about six years ago, um, that uh, foresees the future of biology as really a bit like uh, uh, electronics or c computer engineering. And the interesting thing about that way of looking at it uh, is a wonderful essay, some of you may know, called Why a Biologist Can't Fix a Transistor Radio. Uh, uh, because uh, bi the way biologists go about investigating their subject uh, isn't really to say, here we have a component, what does it do, what is its function, what does it connect to? If you think of it like that, just like a, a radio engineer can fix a defective radio without knowing anything about how a transistor works, um, so uh, if, uh, for example, you have a defective cell, it might be a cancer cell, uh, if you understand the, uh, the um, topology of the gene regulatory network and the information flow, you might be able to fix it by uh, rewiring it. So all this is a roundabout way of saying, saying I think that the distinctive feature of life is its information management and in the great story of the origin of life, which nobody has yet written, there will be um, not just one super duper transition, but a series of transitions uh, elevating the complexity of the information management. You'll see those jumps, not in the chemistry. Uh, the chemistry instantiates the, the logic and the information, uh, but it's not, uh, life is not about the chemistry, it's about that information. And there could be principles of organization of information, it could be universal. Uh, so we look for life elsewhere in the way it manages information and uh, we need to discover what those informational motifs are uh, by looking at simple living things or components of living things and then try to come up with a theory of the complexification of information management to see if there are like, principles of uh, threshold, thresholds at which these things jump. Uh, and the last point I want to make that I really will stop is that a critical aspect of all the major transitions in biology is top-down causation. It's where um, the collective degrees of freedom call the causal shots over the individual degrees of freedom. So I think that the transition from non-life to life is about that inversion from bottom up to top down. So I don't know. Okay. Can, can I ask you, would, could you make a distinction between what you just said and say computer architecture, what happens artificially? Right. I think I think there there is a lot. Of, it's a very close analogy. Of course, we, you know we've designed computers to precisely to fulfil these functions. Mm -hmm. If I'm giving a lecture on this stuff, I usually show a picture of a computer with a screenshot, uh, and I say, to me, just like life looks like uh, magic, Windows looks. Uh, sorry about Mac. Mac users. Windows looks like magic. Give me an explanation, and then I show a picture like of the magic. innards of the computer and arrows pointing to you know silicon and copper and iron and so on and, and a computer engineer might well tell you uh, and might, might say well it's sort of complicated in there but you know it's got something to do with the silicon and we're we're hot on the trail and we're trying to figure it out we need to get down to a smaller scale and work out what all that little patterning is and it's really complex but you know what give us enough money and one day we'll work that out and you know that that's not a, a, a full explanation. You've got to go and see a software engineer and be told uh, that, that, well, it, it w works because of this code and that code. And, and so that's the, the software story. So I think uh, the, the two are actually really very close. But I don't want a designer for, for life, you see. So I want Mother Nature to somehow have contrived right. this uh, without, uh, without uh, literally wiring the, the thing. But isn't another uh, port, a, a 
part of life is metabolism, like Dyson's sort of definition of life, where aside from replication, you have metabolism, and you're including that as well. Sure, you, you absolutely yeah. must, must have metabolism. Uh, none of what I've said will work in an equilibrium system. We've just, just heard this, haven't yes. we? Uh, it's all, it's got to be driven far from equilibrium, there's got to be cycling, uh, the, uh, uh, and metabolism is, is really about the th throughput of energy. And uh, we, we had a whole workshop called uh, uh, Engines of Life, all about uh, alternative metabolisms. Fascinating that cancer, of course, defaults to glycolysis uh, rather than oxi oxidative phosphorylation as, as a preferred mode of metabolism. So that, that's showing that somehow I think you couple the metabolism to the uh, information flow because the information. I'm going to talk about it. Okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's let Carlo jump in because he wanted to say something. So, isn't a characteristic uh, of life on Earth that there is a, a information processing always within a purpose, which for life is to compete with? Oh, speak, speak right, for yourself, right. please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that the, the way I would see that. <laughs> so I would interpret that in informational terms is that living organisms have an internal model of their environment and they've, they've learned uh, and we've heard about all this this afternoon uh, yeah. from the uh, uh, evolution over billions of years they've learned uh, how to cope with situations and they have an internal storage of some of that so they, they've got um, uh, a sort of virtual map of, of the world and their, and their own history, and then they're somehow modeling themselves, as, as uh, Seth will put it. So, they're, they're, so, so therefore, they, they, um, uh, so if they see an environment and they see a set of tasks uh, which have been necessary throughout history in order to survive, then, uh, then this, you could call this purpose. They, they can only have a purpose if they have some sort of representation of themselves and their environment, which is offering a challenge. And it might just be, you know, swimming up a gradient uh, towards a food source or something is, like that. Is that, is that, is that, well, oh, do you want to say something first? Please. Yeah, in support of this, I want to say um, if something can manage their metabolism more efficiently, then that purpose, whatever purpose it is, can probably be achieved um, better by that guy than by the next guy who's not so efficient in his metabolism. And if you can use the way in which you process information to manage your metabolism more efficiently, so to use your free energy better, then it should help you for your purpose, right? So what you're saying and what he's saying are not I mean, they go together, right? But it doesn't mean that they're, I mean, like, what kind of purpose are you talking about? So just re reproduction is the only purpose? purpose. I mean, the reproduction um, with variation gives an apparent purpose to life, but mm -hmm. to say it has a purpose, I think, is going a bit far. I think that this is too complicated. <laughs> this is a, uh, and also people haven't defined things very precisely. Yeah, we here. need I, agents. I really, uh, agents. Yeah, so first yeah, let's, so, let's go to agent next, and maybe yeah, we can okay, put these guys. All right. <laughs> I, 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 can, I want to try to clear this up if you can give me a moment in a second. Can I define life? Promise to define agents first. Oh, yeah, I've got to define Yeah, agents very uh, maybe Bart or Yosho could, oh, could, you want to do could take a stab agent? at agent. Um, this okay. one might I be actually agent. doable. I could do agent. <laughs> okay, good. But, yeah, you know, I'm giving just the AI definition of, of what people call autonomous agents. Uh, these are systems with high-level goals that have computational mechanism to uh, find plans of actions to reach those goals. That's oh. what autonomous That's agents means. Mm -hmm. Should I? Can can I say something? Yeah, please, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I just want to, yeah, this is somewhat disconnected, but but I, I see people appealing to uh, notions of complexity or computational complexity. Uh, so I thought that uh, it got me thinking a little bit what what has happened in computer science in the last maybe 10 years, 20 years, is, is there's a certain growing disconnect between uh, theory and practice in a sense that the notions of computational complexity that, that have been well, very nicely developed uh, over the last 30 40 years um, the relevance of these notions uh, have been has been challenged I would say in the last 10 years uh, and uh, and I myself was actually a big proponent mm -hmm. of those notions early mm -hmm. on so it was with hesitation I observed this um, so if you look at, at, at for example deep learning and and uh, the learning of, of, of computer vision tasks. Um, 
one thing that, that why it was so surprising to, to people in computer science and in machine learning is they would not have assumed that with a million, uh, even less than a million labeled images and a very basic gradient descent algorithm, uh, you could learn that task. So, so the surprise was more that, hey, uh, you don't need actually that, a million sounds like a lot of images, but actually not that many. Uh, because they're training a, a network that has uh, you know, 100,000 to, to a million parameters. And if you talk to a statistician, you say, you don't want to set, with a million examples, you don't want to set a million parameters. Um, so, so computation and complexity-wise, even from a machine learning perspective, it's surprising that you could learn at all from that, <laughs> from that amount of data and with such simple algorithm like a backpropagation algorithm. So there's a bit of a surprise that the same thing with Go, AlphaGo. Why did we predict that it would take another 20 years uh, or even more? Because we were thinking of the search space and we were thinking of how things scale. They scale exponentially. They have a huge branching factor in Go. Um, but apparently, there's something about Go that makes it much simpler than a branching factor the search space would predict. So there's sort of this disconnect between you know formal complexity analysis and actual observations in the real world. Uh, in my own area of, of uh, propositional reasoning, um, when I started out in, in the early 1990s, uh, you know, and I talked to a theoretician, he would say, well, you know, it's an empty complete problem. If you're lucky, you can do two to the hundred, you know, that's already 10 to the 30. Maybe you could solve a problem with 100 variables, empty complete. Okay? Now we're solving problems with 10 million variables, two to the 10 million search space. We can solve them uh, routinely. So there's sort of a disconnect between the practice in computer science and the theory that has been developed. And I guess, uh, I think I, I, the first talk mentioned about structure in the world. It's really the structure in the world that makes these things feasible. The, the discrepancy in the, in the mathematical problem I mentioned yesterday, the uh, Erdos discrepancy conjecture, it's solved because there's more structure than we know of. And algorithms, simple algorithms can now discover that structure. So we need really different complexity measures to really talk about the complexity of real computation. So that was my You should have mentioned your own work on the phase transition structure phase and 3SAT and yeah. so on, but it's yeah. been a nice overlap between statistical physics. Physics, yeah. Right. Yeah, so my connection to physics is that, you know, there's actually, you know, so, so the statistical, so computer science is worse, use worst case analysis. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, there's a realization that that really is way too pessimistic. Average case analysis, statistical analysis, you know, average case analysis also is not quite right. So, um, so we're struggling to what the right notion of complexity is in terms of computational problems. So Yosha, I, I was interested to hear from you. Unfortunately, you're stuck with either free will or consciousness. Let's start with agency. There are a few things that are missing in my view uh, beyond our traditional AI perspective. Um, I think there is a weaker sense of agency. A weak agent is a control system that is capable of influencing an environment, of course, that can uh, measure an aspect of that environment and that has a tendency to direct this measured aspect towards a particular range of values. So your thermostat is is in that area. A stronger agent uh, typically is a BDI agent, belief, desire, intention. What that means is, uh, of course, again, it needs to be capable of influence the environment, so it's somehow effective. Uh, it needs an ability to perceive or know the current states, um, um, on the anticipated states of the environment, and especially the influence changes. So these are the beliefs of the system about the world. Uh, it needs to have some preferences among the environmental states that it can influence. So it has some desires in a technical sense. And it needs to be uh, capable of internal state changes that control how this influence is performed, so some kind of decision making. And it needs to be capable of committing to sets of preferred environmental states via internal state changes, that is goals. So an example of that is your Roomba robot that has both weak agency uh, and strong agency. The weak agency is how it cleans the room because it doesn't know about the room. It just measures some aspects and then it moves about and as a result the room gets cleaner. That's very weak, but it's some kind of agency. The strong agency is when it almost runs out of power, it senses this and then it seeks out a power outlet with the goal to um, increase its power again and that's represented in the agent. And it doesn't stop until it's either dead or uh, has found a power outlet and can recharge. This is a strong sense of agency. And uh, agents must be computers, <coughs> um, at least in the sense of being probabilistic state machines. So they're sufficiently deterministic to do something. And this means also that they are capable of irreversible computation. 
because you want them to be insulated from their environment and have causality that is independent of the underlying substrate of the physical universe that realizes them. And this means that they uh, need an entropy, neck entropy gradient to survive some kind of energy source, colloquially speaking. That is an important aspect of agents. And um, they need to be capable of interpreting part of its structure as an interface to the environment. So even a corporation is an agent in this sense, for instance, not just humans. Um, an agent, is, a strong agent, is also a kind of observer. And an observer, we didn't talk about observers yet, models an environment. And in a strong sense, it approximates Solomonov induction. That is, for its um, current observation and uh, the past um, history of observables, it tries to find a function that predicts that observation. And it does so for all uh, observations and histories that it had. And it tries to find the best functions, and of those, the shortest one. That's the optimum what you can do when you realize, oh my god, I'm a computational robot connected to a universe just by an information layer. What's going on? And Solomonov uh, conjectures this is the situation that we find ourselves in, and this is the limit of what we can do. And somehow, this is what every um, cognitive system tries to approximate at some level. And um, humans are a specific case of this. Um, humans um, start out with feedback loops, of course, like other organisms implement in our brainstem, and these regulate our bodily functions, things like body temperature, heart rate, and so on. And on top of this, because it doesn't always suffice, we have pleasure and pain. Pleasure tells you do more of what you're currently doing. P uh, pain tells you do less of what you're currently doing. And it acts as a reinforcement that gives, you, gives rise to impulses later on. An impulse tells you to seek out future pleasure and pain. And to do this, you need to have something that maps this to environmental states, some kind of pattern matching at least. And this is done in um, higher animals and the hippocampus. The hippocampus gives you some kind of uh, episodic memory that matches features of the world to uh, things that you can use to satisfy your needs and create pleasure or avoid the aversion of your needs, uh, but which would create displeasure. And um, humans have something beyond this. As most higher mammals, we have a neocortex, and this neocortex can be seen as an extension of the hippocampus. And this neocortex is an amazing thing. It takes relatively sparse data and um, generates a dream from it. And this is the world that we inhabit subjectively. It's a dream generated from all the hidden states that you need to predict the sensory patterns at the lowest layer. So our neocortex can produce a virtual world in which we live. And it's made out of something like 50 instruments, different brain areas. And each of these instruments has something like an order of a million cortical columns. Each of those made of something in the order of 100 to 300, 400 neurons. And one of those instruments that play the cortical music is a conductor. And this conductor is not a homunculus. It's just one of the areas like the others. It's probably in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And this thing interfaces with the other instruments to listen, to attend what they do. And it resolves conflicts, performs executive function. And it keeps a protocol of what it attended to. And this protocol is the only place where experience is integrated. And when the system looks at this protocol, it remembers what it attended to a moment ago. And I think this is necessary and sufficient for consciousness, to be a system that is able to remember having been conscious of something a moment ago. So um, you did agent and free and consciousness. Excellent. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last thing, life. Uh, life as we see it is all about cells. <laughs> and uh, initially, I mean, people knew life only as they know, knew space by reference. That is, it's this thing, you know, you can point at it, but you don't really know what it is, and you don't really understand it. So you get weird notions about it. And now, if you ask biologists, uh, biologists what they study, they always study systems made of cells. And uh, a, a cell is a pretty interesting system. You always, you never have a state in the life of an organism where you don't have a cell. You always start with a cell. I mean, evolution probably didn't start with one, but life did. So uh, this cell has an operating system, DNA, RNA, and this operating system tells the cell what to do based on which condition. The cell can sense chemical things, configuration stuff that diffuses over its membrane, and based on this, it can do one of exactly four things. It can regulate the disturbance, or it can differentiate into a different type of cell by changing some of its states and properties and so on. It can divide into two cells, or it can die, apoptosis. 
That's all Kirk it ever can does. Run away. Kirk can run away. <laughs> so uh, based on all this, uh, you get organisms. But organisms are an emergent phenomenon. They are not real, so to speak. There is only the cell. Only the cell is causally relevant. And the cell is an elementary machine capable of universally extracting entropy over a wide env environmental domain. So you as an organism, you are the set of structural principles that has outcompeted all the other sets of structural principles in sucking the neck entropy out of your volume of space. And the cells are the building blocks of that. Okay. Can, can I give a more nihilistic view of what's going on here? I think this is all way too complicated. Can I give a definition of life in 30 seconds? Well, I, can I, I, I'm going to try to give a definition of all these things in 30 seconds. So, Excellent. Okay, <laughs> an observer is a physical system that gets information about the rest of the world. An agent is a physical system that acts on the rest of the world, that is, puts information out there. Almost any physical system is both an observer and an agent. It's getting information, it's acting on the rest of the world. Hmm. A living system is a system that reproduces with variation. For this, it needs free energy. So if you reproduce with variation and you need re free energy produced, then it gives you the, uh, the impression of purpose because they tend to get better at using free energy. Now, so a traveling uh, particle is a living know, system. I, I have, I have another, another five seconds, okay. So now <laughs> to get the rest of the last two, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do, use one thirtieth of the time you did. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, to have a sense of free will, I would argue you need to have a sense of self-reference. That's all you need. And consciousness, I don't know what it is, but I know it's overrated. Most people are unconscious 99% of the time. <laughs> so I wanted to connect back to the yesterday and this morning, kind of the fundamental physics view, but give a definition of life. Non-static, non-equilibrium, non-Hamiltonian, non-linear, non-stationary, non-ergodic, non-diagonalizable, non-detailed, balanced, and unpredictable. So that's what life isn't? <laughs> it isn't all of those things? No, that is what life is. <laughs> it's also a reflection of my career. I always work on things described by what they're not. But it's not a proper definition, right? It's a, it's a great definition. Features. It's a set of features. <laughs> Uh, and you described a set of features yourself. I think so it's a, uh, I would like to have a functional representation. That ah. is, I want to see how it works. I'm a computer scientist, so I'm. I am being a little space. facetious in this, but it, it, this is this is like a, a negative reflection, and I'm slicing mm -hmm. through the space and mm -hmm. cutting it up. So if you looked at the intersection of all those things, you'd get pretty close to what is life. Uh, I'm not very happy with your definition of consciousness <laughs> test, by the way. I mean, uh, if you would say, uh, let's uh, define life, and you should, in the same words, you could say life is pretty much overrated. Most people are dead most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> There's something related to what you say there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when they're dead, we don't usually call them people. <laughs> Well, I, say, I would say nightlife is often overrated. <laughs> I mean, your definition of consciousness didn't really address the hard problem of consciousness. It was just sort of, this is the apparatus that's doing it. No, actually, um, I do think that's the hard problem. Um, I do think that if you build a system that has this conductor, that has a protocol of the things that it attended to, and that uh, talks about this protocol, then the system will tell you, oh my god, I, have, I remember having been so conscious just now, and this cannot be explained in any mechanistic way. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a difference philosophically between that and and the fact that you know consciousness has to do with the sort of existence and 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 a notion of reality, um, and you know you could have conscious beings made out of silicon perhaps and so forth, and 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 they'd still have the same problem consciousness. Now uh, I would join you, says and say that existence and reality are highly overrated concepts, and we should maybe replace them with less loaded concepts that do the same work. I think it's a matter of how interested you are in these sorts of philosophical questions. <laughs> so one thing I'd like to, uh, we've had a lot of discussion <laughs> from, from Seth especially about self-reference, and I, I'd like to understand which of these different sort of entities self-reference is kind of a part of, necessary for. I didn't necessarily hear it, I, I wasn't sure if you had it in your level, agent level one and or two. Um, it seems necessary for, for Seth's funny definition of free will, um, which I'd also like to come back to. I didn't define free will. How many times do I have to say that? <laughs> you, you called your talk a, a Turing test for free will. Absolutely. I didn't so, define it. 
<laughs> and that was the no, brilliant. No, got it. Yeah, that's right. I, I would say when when things would say they've got it. I didn't say I didn't define what it was. <laughs> so so which do we need self-reference if we have, you know, what if we have life, if we have free will, if we have consciousness, if we have agency? Which of these require building a, a model of yourself and, and referring to it? I would put that. All of them? I think so. Yeah, I mean, well, so if you, if you can't even ask the question, what am I going to do, then you're probably not going to even think about free will. Come up right? with a good you can be alive. I mean, E. coli is alive. Does it no, think well, that? No, but I asked about, I mean, an agent, yeah. it, it seems from the definition of agent, you know, a thermostat does not have a self-model, I would say, but it yeah. might be a very simple agent. Sure. Um, so where, where in the spectrum do we need to have a, a model of, the, a, a self-referential model in order to have it do the stuff that we attribute to these? I'll start with intelligence. Intelligence, in my view, is something like the detection of causality. Of course, causality is made largely a property of our models. But it means conditional state transition. And if you have a sufficiently intelligent system that try, uh, is in the service of regulating the disturbances of an organism and uh, enables cognition to do this, then at some point it will start modeling itself to get uh, understand its own disturbances. And this modeling itself it means that the system starts to model itself as a causal system. So. Uh, you can see this in the evolution of uh, genesis of every human being, that at some point the baby no longer identifies with its pleasure and pain, but and, uh, sees them as something that is separate from itself. It starts to debug them, to model them. Then it stops identifying with its impulses. Then it stops identifying with its needs. It stops identifying with its goals. And if it gets very, very smart, as most people don't do, it starts ident uh, stops identifying with its values. And it doesn't stop there, of course. It also, you can stop identifying with your consciousness and with your reality construction, your self-model. And all these things means that you start modeling yourself as a causal system. And in some sense, to me, this is the project of AI. Well, nice. Um, what about squirrels? <laughs> what about what? Squirrels. Yeah. Squirrels. Okay. The squirrels are the meaning of life, that's all. <laughs> Quarrels are the meaning of life. Yeah, Did you say that? It's cartoon. You know, there's a nihilist talking to another one and says that nothing ever can have meaning and purpose objectively. In the sense that, totally correct. But look at the squirrels. But the squirrel <laughs> has to solve fairly complicated tasks and, you know, know a hell of a lot about physics and probably also causality to do its cool squirrel jumping, flying thing there, you know. But is it self-referential? I don't know. I mean, they measure these things, right? These these dolphins, they can see when you put a dot on their nose. These some monkeys can, and you know. It will probably has point. a self-model the in the sense there are features the squirrels, that are always they, available they, they, to they the can. squirrel. So from this biologist definition of like self-aware, the biologist definition I think would be that the squirrel isn't self-aware yet. Let alone the squirrel is solving all these tasks that you say, without the self-referentiality. So I'm really not seeing why the self-referentiality is needed to solve the tasks that you were proposing. Can, can I add something to that? There's, there's, a, a, there's a, a nice new book by Noam Chomsky and Bob uh, uh, Berwick out there called uh, Why Only Us? And it, I know it's a somewhat controversial book, but the, the thesis of the book is if you look at the, at, at the languages spoken by human beings and you look at the language that are spoken by many other animals, by all other animals actually, and many animals are very verbal and communicate with each other in highly sophisticated and complicated ways, that it seems that only human beings actually speak a language that is fully recursive, that is, that is the kind of thing that we could, that a universal Turing machine. With a sex size of about four. I'm sorry. With a stack size of about four, it emulates recursion. It approximates it. Right. Well, but e but even but 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 you know, dolphins and chimpanzees fail at recursion completely at level one. Okay. Yeah. So um, so there and the recursion does by its very definition actually require the ability to have a, a form of self-reference. That's kind of a thing which makes recursion recursion. Recursive programs. One it's a different sense itself. of self. It's I'm not sorry? the same sense of self. The self-reference yeah, and only, recursion is only, a different It's only one. this form of self-reference that I described before, that program number 42 can call up program number 42. That's the definition of recursion. So, But that's enough self-reference to give you this fully recursive feature. And other animals, like squirrels, don't seem to possess this. Even chimpanzees don't seem to possess this. And so there really does seem to be some feature about what we human beings call consciousness um, 
which is related to our own universal language, which is something very special out there in the world. And ironically, the only creatures out there that seem to possess it as well are computers. And we gifted it to them, because when we gave them computer language, the languages, we made them fully recursive. But it does not seem that squirrels, dolphins, and chimpanzees possess this. But, but you're I, cheating. You, uh, we don't have a reference to the root node of our address in the universe or something like a self-referential program would have. The self that you were referring to in the terms of uh, self-model is a story that the brain tells itself about all itself. I'm stating, all I'm stating is that human language lies at the top scale of the Chomsky hierarchy. I'm not cheating. Right? I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see how that's No, cheating. I mean this equation <laughs> of the self of a human with the self of a program as a, a, a pointer to an address a, is very different. I'm just a fact about human language, an okay. analytic fact about human language. It's not really, I mean, it's, it's either, you know, either chimpanzees can comprehend fully recursive languages or they can't. There's plenty of evidence that they can't, right? So I actually believe, you know, if the, chip, the, the, the squirrel that's jumping through the forest, when I jump through the forest around here as well, my experience of like taking in information and jumping over branches is probably rather squirrel-like, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's fantastic. I mean, I would love to be able to fly like a squirrel from branch to branch. I want to see you do that. Too. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, uh, until I trip and fall, but you know, just the experience of taking in the information and, and moving my body so I can jump over branches and then maybe trip is probably pretty similar between animal and animal. On the other hand, once you start to get to conferences like this where we talk about all kinds of BS, then I, I think that squirrels, you know, maybe are not quite, you know, fortunately for them, at the same level. Okay. Exactly. I've noticed a scary line of people mm -hmm. waiting to ask questions, yeah. so we should we should go to them. Four minutes. Um, uh, just one more thing. Uh, Susanna asked a very important question a moment ago. Why? Why is it that we are not like the squirrels? Uh, why is it that we have this? I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> you asked about this difference to the squirrels, right? No. No. What, did, what was it? I was trying to ask you what you get out of your, like you, you were making some, one of your many definitions where you said that somehow to figure something out about causality and so on, you need self-referentiality and it doesn't seem logical. And so I was trying to point out that the squirrel even though it solves the task that you were saying you need self-referentiality for, it doesn't have it, at least under the measures of biologists or whatever. That's what I was trying to tell you. Do you have so I, I don't, of can I answer to this? <laughs> Speaking of definitions, okay. uh, I was, you're trying to define a lot of terms, and apart from the importance of understanding what we're talking about, which is a very re important reason to define things, I'd be curious what the panelists think of these terms, which are the most important to define for reasons above communication, and why these issues are important to define. I don't think any of these terms are particularly important to define. <laughs> yes. I'd agree. They're, they're, they're very important, and it's important to discuss. But to try to give a precise mm -hmm. definition of any one of them is probably hopeless and could be actually destructive. So I think it's we great to time. natter on about it. But, the uh, the multiple definitions. To define it, maybe not. Yeah. Well, I think you have to define things in term, you know, to the extent that you explain them within a context, I mean, but anyway. Within a context. Well, yeah, I, I did, context. I, I, of course, I did define them, so I'm completely yeah. guilty. But anyway, <laughs> so, um, and I, ask me later, I have a very funny squirrel story. I actually have several. Um, but aside from that, I, I want to switch gears here for a second, and something that's been uh, rubbing at me since the discussion of free will, um, it, Mauro Dariano is not here. Um, he's a Chicago woman, but, um, uh, I, many of you may know that he wrote a paper about the difference between determinism and causality. And, and I see Seth nodding his head. Oh, yeah. But, but I'll go with it. Yeah. So um, in terms of free will, it seems like there could be something said about that. And this free will, um, I don't know. What's the relationship between free will, determinism, and causality? And um, this, this, the distinction between causality and determinism um, play a role. Actually, that Bertrand Russell quote that I quoted about, about the notion, it was originally about causality. He said the notion of causality, you know, well, apparently harmless, you know, like the, is actually a harmful notion and should just be discarded. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, actually, though, of course, interestingly, this has now come, there have been a lot more nice statistical approaches to causality based on, for example, on Bayesian networks uh, from Judea Pearl's work and the, the theory of inference. I mean, these things are all bound up in each other. I don't think that there are, we have really good answers for them. They're wonderful topics of 
discussion and, and research. We don't have a good definition of causality in terms of statistics. We know some things. We don't have a good definition of free will, though we know some things. Right. So and we're getting close to our end of time, so let's let's get these three questions in now before we before we wrap up. Uh, yes, you mentioned that human language has recursion <laughs> and uh, I think most and no other species has that, and I think most animal communications people would disagree with that. Be, yeah, I, I told I said it was controversial. Yeah, yeah it's it's um, well, yeah, I would say dolphins also. Well, there's a signature whistle hypothesis, which is the idea that dolphin calls out its name before it starts to speak. I think it's a hailing frequency myself, but there's an awful lot of. Um, I guess what I, my my. Uh, motivation is to kind of dissolve this artificial boundary between human language and other species language. And I think the idea of recursion is, is important to it. We did, <clears throat> colleagues did some interesting uh, experiments with dolphins. In chimpanzees, you mark them and they see a red mark and they touch it in a mirror and that shows they're recognizing it's on them. They do it with, a, with water and they don't touch it. We did that with dolphins. And some people object to the dolphins didn't touch the mark, but uh, they do spend about four times as much time in front of the mirror. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. That there's more, in my opinion, more of a continuity. And the animal communications people and linguistic people have to talk before the linguistics people come out with statements that say animals have this characteristic when they don't. Yeah, my, my cousin, Peter Tyak, whom I'm sure you know, because he works in the same field. Oh, yeah, he's the thesis advisor of my colleague, yeah. Yeah, I have had lots of discussions about that. So there's a difference between having the ability of self-identification, so like having a name that you shout out, like humpback whale songs in some sense, are just male whales saying me, 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 over and over again, which I've noticed. The songs, yeah. Which is kind of common to males all over the world, including on this <laughs> panel. And uh, uh, then, uh, then, you know, but that's different than having recursion, right? Like having, being able to say me, or, or noticing that you're recognizing yourself in the mirror, is different from being able to construct an utterance that uses you as part of the utterance to say, you know, if you do this, then I will do that. That's the kind of thing that are recursive. Yeah, we and that would know. that would be. I'm I'm not I've not been I'm not aware of evidence that other animals have that that kind of recursive structure. They, they definitely have syntax, yeah. and they have grammatical rules between their signals because of the conditional probabilities. And so we don't know yet. Is Absolutely. what I'm saying. So so the clock is blinking red. So maybe just two more questions, and then we're going to have to. Focus. So so I had a very specific question that I'm sure there must be an answer to, as well as a more general comment. So the specific question is, is there a concrete um, definition within computer science of um, degree of, of um, uh, ability to, to self-reference? Um, are there some machines or codes that, are, that have a greater ability to refer to themselves than others? Is there a concrete measure of this problem? Um, I know this is an old question, but um, I, just in my own existence, I think this, this question about distinction between humans and squirrels um, carries a certain level of absurdity. And I'll bring a personal um, relevance to that, because I have a nonverbal daughter. I've lived with this uh, person for 17 years. She is every bit as conscious as every person in that house. And for many of these discussions, there's a level of absurdity trying to draw a distinction between, for example, humans and other animals just because we can't speak to them. That strikes me as I'm going to use the word ridiculous, and I think if that's your standard, you're just very much in the wrong place. And okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, we've been, or you've been talking about agents and consciousness and living things, and um, it strikes me that like the whole time there was the assumption that we already know what they are, like where you draw the borders. But if you just look at physical interactions at the micro level, there is no, I mean, what is even an agent, right? And with consciousness, for example, it's not even clear if the prefrontal cortex is necessary at all for consciousness or not. So there's, I was wondering if there's a physical, if physics has to say something about how to draw the borders around agents that exist. Agents that exist or consciousness? Agents, things, like... Uh -huh. Yeah. I guess I've, I've had a lot of problem with some of the reference here. Uh, let me answer by way of analogy. The sociologist Ed Hutchins has a, a nice thing encapsulated that 
that language doesn't stand on its own, and nor does knowledge. His rather beautiful book, uh, Cognition in the Wild, he spent a number of years on the bridge of an aircraft carrier looking at how the team of 15 or 20 people navigated and drove the ship without running it in a ground, and how the necessary functioning sets of rules, instruments that encoded knowledge, and, and the point is that the language of the knowledge, the actual functioning was very distributed over that whole team. So. I, I would really love to just keep doing this, but we can't, because uh, then we'll, we will not have the time for the lightning talk. So I think we should wrap it up and thank all our speakers. <laughs> and <laughs>